Perfect. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this second session. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Waters from the University of Leiden, where he has been for almost eight years the director of the Center for Science and Technology Studies, the CWTS, which you all probably know pretty well from September uh, 2010 to December 2018. Well, exactly more than eight years, but about the time. Uh, as you probably know, Paul has published extensively on the history of uh, science citation indexes. He has published both about and inside science metrics. He has published about how the criteria of scientific quality and relevance have changed the use of performance indicators, which is why it's a great speaker to kick off this afternoon session. So, Paul, the floor is yours. I will tell you when we are at the point at 35 minutes. Oh, yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, organizers for the opportunity to share some experiences with you. And I'm really uh, very uh, curious what you will think about uh, an adventure that um, I was involved in for the last two years at the request of the leadership of the League of European Research Universities, which is an organization of a number of European uh, research universities. Uh, and the request was to conduct uh, uh, some kind of review with the question, okay, to what extent can we, uh, as universities, develop policies with respect to next generation metrics? Um, I will show at the end uh, the page of the Leary website where you can find the report. In the end, we produced a much longer report than we had expected because we wanted to give practical recommendations to the different audiences in the universities. Um, and first, I will try to walk you through the main recommendations of the report. Um, so, it's, this is not uh, an original research paper like the beautiful presentation we just had. It's also not a synthesis of 20 or 30 years of research like Chao Mei uh, very elegantly did. Um, but it's actually a kind of hybrid between philosophy of science because of the assumptions that we put into the evaluation process. Second, of course, metrics because we also developed during the conversations for the past two years in that committee also ideas about new roles for metrics experts and for people who are uh, uh, first in, in dealing with metrics, both as producers and as advanced users. And third, um, that makes it a tricky thing, uh, also uh, the, yeah, the desire of university leaders to know what to do with it. Uh, so it's also a link with uh, university policy and science policy at the level of the university administration. And of course, that runs the risk. And we, we saw, we discussed this at the beginning, that we would be busy with dealing with uh, hypes uh, and with uh, completely misplaced expectations uh, or with misplaced fears. So that's why we really uh, started to work in a very collaborative way and tried to also find out what was actually happening at the different Leary universities. Um, okay, let me quickly go to, uh, through the uh, uh, presentation of the recommendations. Uh, not so much to bother you with every individual recommendation, but give you a flavor of what we are dealing with. And it was published earlier this month on the 6th of May, while we were uh, discussing this with PhD students and postdocs at KU Leuven, um, and uh, also uh, Kunde Bakker of, of Leuven University, who was one of the important authors of this report. Um, so we decided to try to produce something that the Rectores Magnifici 
of the Leary universities could undersign, could agree on. And at the same time, we wanted to, to give concrete handles, practical recommendations that both uh, libraries in the universities, metrics experts, PIs, research leaders, and guys like deans or faculties could do something useful with. Um, so basically our report uh, deals with four different domains. One is an overview of the development of next generation metrics, the use of next generation metrics, and of course the definition of it, what is it? Um, an overview, and we did that very thoroughly, we think, but of course that's always moving, so it's probably already outdated. An overview of the current status of metrics use at universities and metrics policies. Although actually that was a bit of a disappointment. Um, metrics policies are not very advanced uh, at most universities. Um, and then uh, we came up with something that was unexpected in the beginning. Um, a look at the possibilities of new forms of metrics uh, development and use at universities based on the idea that universities could make much better use of the data they already have and the data that they own themselves, uh, if only the processes that manage those data and produce those data were better coordinated. Uh, and we, at the end of the report, we also produced a visualization of those opportunities with uh, the proposal that universities could perhaps also work together on this. Um, and fourth, in each chapter we have recommendations and just to make sure that Rectores Magnifici would also read them, we also put them in a different chapter at the end, but that was repetitive because of course we didn't expect that these busy people would read the whole thing. Okay, what are next generation metrics? Um, well, that's a, of course a matter of perspective. Um, no essentialist attempt here, uh, but we decided that it would be most useful for universities if it would be an interest, and you know, basically uh, something of everything, um, uh, according to this picture. So we included also already existing metrics that are being used in different ways. We included also the idea to give advice on what not to do with uh, existing and potentially new developed uh, next generation metrics. Um, and we decided that it would be wise to give recommendations also with respect to the context of use of indicators, including the level of aggregation at which indicators can be useful uh, within a certain context and become totally useless or uh, even harmful at other levels of uh, aggregation. Well, for you, this is all uh, nothing new, um, but we discovered that during the conversations we had with uh, Leary people that, yeah, it, uh, it is a bit of a terra incognita for many people who are involved in decision making. So we, we also thought, okay, we should try to summarize also things that are totally not uh, new uh, or interesting for the metrics experts, but still useful in this report. So this is this is the generic recommendation with respect to next generation metrics. So we stress in this. Uh, so it's basically two sentences. One is uh, make uh, use of indicators in the right context. Um, that also support the process, and I think Giovanni will talk about this as well, uh, of responsible research evaluation, which is a huge debate at the moment in European universities at least. Um, I think currently the Gaza war is a bigger debate, but um, this is uh, something that will uh, continue, the responsible research evaluation discussion. Um, and that align, and this is maybe even more crucial, align with your institution's mission. So at different levels. So keep your own goals central and don't get uh, distracted by promises about metrics that actually 
are not so interesting or relevant for your mission. And of course, this also can be discipline specific. I could imagine that an operational mission in a physics institute would really be quite different in terms of what you have to do uh, compared to a history uh, department. And then the second sentence, please start to collaborate on this, um, both on the use and reuse of existing metrics on uh, experiences with that and in uh, development of new uh, things uh, or next generation metrics. Um, so what are next generation metrics? This is the definition in the report. Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, it's basically what I already uh, said. It's uh, something of everything. Um, we want to make sure that um, uh, the different recommendations in this report would also be relevant for the uh, universities in all European, at least European, maybe international countries. And the scientific system does have interesting differences according to different nations. And sometimes the bottleneck is that nepotism is too too heavy, sometimes uh, the reliance on commercially produced indicators is too heavy, so that really varies. And this also means that you also have to adapt uh, with your uh, uh, metrics policies with respect to those situations. Um, and um, yeah, we, we, we here emphasize for the, uh, for the leaders of the universities that sometimes it's even more important to start to agree on what not to do uh, and what not to uh, to let happen than uh, uh, bold new initiatives with disregarding what is uh, already happening, uh, what you should change. Um, is it readable actually? Um, so these, these are the recommendations for the transition to next generation metrics. Uh, I'm not going to talk about everyone, but um, maybe it's good to say here that we, we, in our conversations, we concluded that there are two main drivers at the moment, two main motivations for people to ask about next generation metrics. One is the fact that universities are being confronted with increasingly advanced companies, tech companies, information companies, and publishers, who produce all sorts of new indicators, databases, and rich uh, uh, information sources uh, and that they try to sell. So both libraries and metrics experts and universities are confronted with uh, uh, yeah, the need to, to respond to this and to, to think about what to do with this. Uh, and this is one of the things why Boards are asking for, okay, what shall we do with next generation metrics? And this includes, of course, also the promise that new technologies always bring with them, like AI. And the second uh, is uh, the fact that universities in Europe are increasingly also emphasizing the way we are working in terms of um, policies with respect to the conditions under which research is being implemented and one of the big ones here is open science open science is also a formal european policy and it increasingly uh, it's not only about making scientific publications more easily available for non-scientists but also about citizen science including the public in different ways in engagement and also increasingly about fair data and sophisticated fair data policies. Uh, and this means that universities also want to know how they're doing there. They want to monitor themselves. And for that, they also want new forms of indicators, metrics, qualitative and quantitative. So that's one thing. So we identify also this, these, both, um, uh, both of these uh, processes by in the end of the report indicating that basically Next generation metrics is about measuring existing activities and processes in new ways and measuring new uh, processes and activities uh, uh, that are currently not yet included in 
in the in the process at universities. And uh, and we think that there are two main application domains, and we try to tailor the different recommendations in the different chapters to this. One is the debate about how should we evaluate and reward individual researchers and individual research groups. So at a very low level of aggregation. Uh, so what is included in the performance interview? And this, of course, is extremely important for uh, young generation researchers, postdocs, PhD students uh, who want to make a career and need to know what they have to do in order to make progress in their careers. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing, uh, the other uh, is the fact that uh, at the high level of uh, university policies, we have this demand for metrics that fit that, that can help to monitor universities to know where they are, where they stand. And currently, very often they use the, uh, the preferred, uh, preferred uh, uh, the basically prefers global university rankings that are, uh, most of them, except maybe a few, uh, are um, basically not really tailored to uh, fit the goals of most uh, research universities. So there is also this demand for you know better policies at the level of the, and the, the, these are two different application domains. They need two different types of answers, and this is also really important. Uh, something that we need to drive home. Um, I'm going to show you just that we have different recommendations because uh, I, I don't have time to walk you through all the recommendations. Um, we, we, we discovered that um, a number of other organizations based ba ba busy with uh, evaluation in different ways have developed an interesting framework called the SCOPE framework for research evaluation, which we think could be used uh, as a kind of general framework in which we can implement and, and apply uh, different forms of next generation metrics. Um, and we, we, for example, with respect to metrics policy, we explicitly recommend that universities are explicitly and critically evaluating the biases inherent both in the data they have and in the indicators they want to use, uh, even if it's not uh, so easy at first sight to immediately see this. And also indeed, for this reason, also include experts on metrics in their decisions, because they often know more about the internal workings of specific indicators than lay people. Um, yeah, and then uh, a general recommendation is also, which I think is a valuable part of the Koara initiative, but maybe Giovanni has a different perspective on this, is that this idea of evaluate with the evaluated. And this is, I think, a key issue, maybe not always um, explicitly uh, valued in the debates about metrics policies. Uh, because very often the whole idea of using indicators is based on a fundamental lack of trust, an explicit mistrust in the possibilities for the academic community to be honest uh, about their uh, 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 performance. And I've been dean for five years now of the social science faculty at Leiden University. And my conclusion, it was also my assumption at the beginning, but my conclusion, after five years is that the academic community as a whole, with here and there exceptions, as a whole in the general way of working is brutally honest about uh, their own um, uh, performance and the weaknesses in performances and also where they want to go, especially the younger generation because they want to learn. Um, I'm not saying that there are not uh, problematic power relationships, there certainly are. And there are complex dependencies among uh, PhD students and supervisors that are also internationally uh, uh, dominant. So that is also a source for misbehavior in academia. But with respect to metrics, 
the assumption that we need metrics because the research community themselves cannot, as a community, produce an honest view on the scientific performance is completely misplaced. And for this reason, we explicitly recommend to evaluate with the evaluated. And be but that requires transparency in order to also promote honesty, of course, otherwise we are uh, too naive about uh, the honesty of scientific community. So this is why we explicitly also recommend that next generation metrics requires transparency of the metadata, not only of the data, but also of the metadata. And I'm very happy that my successors at CWTS have decided to completely open up the Leiden ranking so that this can now be used also for uni by universities to take a look at their own performance in a limited area. It's not valid for all research fields. It's certainly not valid for uh, uh, evaluating teaching or other activities, but it is certainly um, what it tries to measure, it does measure, and it, uh, it is transparent about this. I think that's a great step forward, and it did require to uh, let loose uh, the Web of Science data source and start to develop new data sources, which is also a very important area. And given the time, I would like to, we, we also have specific recommendations on data handling, because we think that, um, in the, the, that the quest for next generation metrics would be strongly supported if the data specialists that are everywhere at universities would be involved much more consistently. Uh, because we now also have new approaches to data handling in computer science, in massive uh, data operations that we are actually not yet using in uh, enough in applied scientometrics for university policy. So that would really be very interesting. Uh, we basically, uh, very politely in the report, because we wanted that the rectoris magnifici would undersign it, we politely recommend to throw away the f obsession with uh, global, the most, most global university rankings. And here are some, some recommendations in order to make this happen. Uh, and, of course, we also recognize the ethical side of uh, university policies and next generation metrics policies, uh, because it's not, not, uh, not ethically not neutral, which doesn't mean that you shouldn't base yourself, of course, on empirical data and evidence, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, but there is always in applying these kind of things an ethical dimension. Okay, what I would like to show with you is, yeah, this. Um, because this is something that we put on the agenda and we ourselves have not yet been able to practically develop this, but it would be fantastic if we, if universities and we recommended Leru universities to start to form little groups of three or four universities and set up new experiments. Um, on the use of the data that they already have available for next generation metrics by universities themselves. And here it would be fantastic if this could be done with the community that you represent, both philosophers and metrics people. Um, and for this, we uh, developed a visualization based on the idea that these uh, platforms, religious aggregator services, and research assessment experts are all five parties that should be involved. And then we could try out developing next generation metrics in this way. So this is different from the question, what kind of contract do we have to sign with Elsevier? Um, this is about, okay, we, on the left side, we have um, the uh, demand uh, parties, universities, research organizations, platforms. On the right side, we have metrics and data producing uh, 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 parties, uh, actors. Um, then we have two domains that we think are at the moment crucial, but this can change, of course, over time. But one is this open science and scholarship debate at European universities. I think in the United States and Canada, this may be different. 
the dimension of this, but in Europe this is a big thing at the moment. And the recognition and rewards debate. So those could be two focal points for European universities at the moment. And then we have this thing about, okay, we want to measure different things and we want to measure things differently. Um, and on the right side, so this is the demand side. And then on the right side, we have um, uh, new types and characteristics of data, metrics, and metadata. The how, how then do we make the connections? So then this is the idea that we have a visualization on the web. Um, I will ask Eugenio to, to show you the, the website where you can find all this stuff. Um, the idea is basically that, for example, about fair data, and we want to monitor how fair data is developing in, for example, the natural science faculty, then you could uh, uh, start from the left and look at the right where the uh, data availability possibilities are and what needs to be done to make that link, what is lacking at the moment. And then three or four universities could start to work together to make that connection possible and practical. And then you could then other universities could learn from this. This of course also holds for universities that are not member of LERU. Uh, we, we just produce it for the LERU leadership, but it's available for everybody. And maybe we could switch to the to the, the website where you can find everything. And I could then also give credit to my co-authors. The Google Chrome. Yes. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, the web page at Leru, the, the Leru web page, uh, Leru.org, L E R U.org, and then publications. And then you, this is the third tile. And these are the people who produced this report. It was really intense work by all of them. So this is, um, and they uh, they did different tasks. So we, we distributed the, the responsibilities. Uh, there is also a little interview with me, which is not very important for you, but to to accompany this uh, this report for people who have never heard of next generation metrics. You can download the full paper and the executive summary, and there you can also see the uh, visualization that I just showed, which is dynamic. So you can. You can just walk through with these with different arrows, but of course, this is uh, to your imagination. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm very curious about, you know, all the things that we should have done and didn't do, or assumptions that are completely misplaced, um, or uh, or suggestions for follow-up work. Um, the group wants to continue, um, and th th they will be led by Jeroen Bosman and um, uh, Will William Cawthorn, so uh, a Dutch and British University, Edinburgh. And I think it's nice that the British University is also included, so that we also give a bit of a pushback to the stupid Brexit nonsense. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And uh, well, it's I'm, I'm almost a bit embarrassed as a chair because it never happened in my career. We are we have a lot of time, like 30 minutes for Q and A. So please don't be shy and come here to let the people from house listen. To you, please. Thank you. But it will be more of a comment, the uh, context. Okay. And the first context would be that. Uh, I've been in charge of the Observatory of Science and Technology for 28 years, so not exactly as you know very well. And what strikes me is that at the beginning, you clearly said uh, that no one in the machine, the VP, the president of the universities, and all those managers, in fact, don't know much about what, as you said, we all know here, because that's our job to uh, do it. And I think that can explain the fact that, according to me, this report, as absolutely nothing new, which we've been saying that for 25 years. I could send you the report of the Canadian uh, academies that has been done, uh, and I was on the committee for the thing now, 2012. And the new thing is that since it's Europe, we are 
totally obsessed with rankings again or evaluation and then we say okay we have next generation indicator okay next generation indicator so what are they in fact as i said this morning what can we measure there's a number a finite number say five maybe six things to play with that there's oh yes the alt matrix the the fad of alt matrix which was supposed to be alternative but not alternative they were different things they were about web access or users and the scale of that is a few days and you go on the on the x it's always been so the real problem that i see is that we keep saying the same thing and try okay now we have next generation more inclusive and i see a problem i will be sure but when i say okay now we have new indicators like what okay we should take care about you said it open science well then i say okay but uh is that the mission of the university? If I measure open science before that, I have to say to the professor, your mission is not just to publish in nature. It's that in addition to have a paper there, it must be open access. Okay, but that's not really my mission. If you tell me that, it's okay, it's a new mission. We had a debate 25 years ago in Quebec about a new mission of the university called innovation. I said, well, it's not a job. As a mission, we innovate in the common sense world. So when I, I have not read the report, but I can make the hypothesis that all the words that will be said there have been saying repeatedly, saying that, okay, uh, ranking, you should take care about ranking. Everyone knows that. We told them for 25 years. We should take care about the limitation of indicators. Okay, thank you very much. We have said that for 25 years. It's not a, you know, it, it's not a critique of, no, 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 I, 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 it, but that, I would like to give a response. It's quite useless, and it's based on your words. So I, I conclude with a question. You say, okay, next generation. I train the next generation of students. Exactly. What are they? Do we have a next generation of indicators? Instead of saying, stop using indicators, except for the macroscopic level of the university. No indicators for research evaluation, because if they send me your CV, I will say, give him a promotion to emeritus. I don't need indicators for that because I know the field. If I need indicators, it's because I don't know the field. And if I don't know the field, I should not evaluate. So that's the theorem I put in my book on research evaluation, use and abuse. If you need indicators, you don't know the field, then you should not evaluate. You know the, the field, you don't need indicators, then you should evaluate. So all of this is a remake of bureaucrats at the high level of, of Europe and it will be useless. I'm sorry to be harsh, but it's not against you, but against those European things that thinks we need evaluating at the, at the microscopic level. You said, oh, there are three levels. They won't care. They will continue to evaluate individuals using those same habitual indicators. They will give new names, the alt matrix or alt matrix square. I'm very critical of that and it's more of the same that 25 years later we are the same place they don't understand you tell it at the beginning but you have been dean so you are in between i've never been dean i'm just a straight researcher sorry to be frank like that i know i like this very much thank you very much um, um yeah well I, I i will give you the response that i was thinking in the earlier debates you had here um, because I think you're not sociological enough. What you what you basically say is that we um, it is. Let me first say where I agree with you. Certainly, it's true that this report uh, was not meant to produce any new insight. It was produced to to uh, it was meant to produce synthesis of existing insights in a way that it would perhaps be. Um, understandable for the leadership. That was the assignment. But what decided to also write something with concrete recommendations for the different audiences and different publics in the universities. So we only saw the Rectoris Magnifici as the, the post we needed to get past in order to reach the audience at the universities. That's one. Second, it is true that there are many insights in this report that were already produced by you 25, 40 years ago, 
um, which uh, is not a problem for me because it is sometimes worth repeating, repeating, repeating important insights. Um, but what I find interesting is that you basically don't see the interaction between the field of metrics and scientometrics and the science policy as a sociological process, because there is an explanation why your insights 25 years ago were not leading to an important radical break by universities. And we need to understand this. In your role, because yeah. in North America, it's, it's different. It makes a big difference. That's true. But it must always That's be true. end to end policies in COVID. Yes. And then the yes. Ends it. But it's a small. Society. True, true, true. But I happen to live in Europe. <laughs> we are here living in Europe. These universities are living in Europe and they have to deal with policy pressures, with societal connections, in order to be able to protect the core mission of academic research. Just saying we are academics and we have freedom for uh, uh, researching whatever we want and we don't want to bother with the problem of how we should organize our performance interviews would not work. So this, so I would recommend you to, to, to use your sociological insight to lift it one level up and to also analyze the interaction between scientometrics and science policy from both a metrics and a policy perspective. Absolutely. And then, then you would have to conclude that it does make sense to now and then write reports that are repeating all the insight. Yeah. Just a small compliment, but here, now, because which I, 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 which I forget and which is very important. Now, for example, when we talk about metrics, we talked about indicators, we need an indicator. So when we accept, which we, you, you can do that, I, make, I disagree with this, but for example, the societal impacts, we measure societal impact, but societal impact is not a metric. You can have case studies that for the Ministry of Economics. What are the impacts of this, your research on your research? It's a case study, but it's not a metric. A metric is an indicator that will be every year. So when you add it in the list to please them, because we have to take them into account, I'm more radical. I think I should tell them, if you want a metric, a metric is a very precise concept which needs a continuity. If you want societal impact, we can measure it, it costs much more. It's only based on case study, but it's not a metric. It's not an indicator. So at some point, I agree that we can give some, but here, I think, in the sense of practicality, you say, oh, we have to give them everything. I, I, I would not give them open science because who pays for open science? Who pays? The government don't want to pay for open science. Oh, yeah. To open science. So we have to give a bit but not too much. So I think that on the social impact as indicator, it's a mistake in terms of the uh, metrics. It's not a metric at all. Okay, but I think you are now a bit too conservative. Uh, the Dutch government actually does give a lot of money for open science. So the trick is to prevent that money to be wasted on nonsense around open science to make sure that okay. it's being used in a creative way. Uh, so yeah, so, so but, but yeah. And, and, and uh, well, if you read the report, you will see that there are many recommendations that are in line with your view on uh, the use of sensible, responsible metrics. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We still have uh, like a lot of time for live exchange, but also a lot of people lined up. So Eugenia first, then one, two, three. Thank you very much, Paul. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, so my question is, kind of follow up of Eve's question, but more with the, the philosophy of science hat okay. on it. So uh, from a philosophy of science perspective, I always see there's a sort of missing point. I mean, we have all okay. these metrics and indicators, but then what is the connection they have with the kind of ultimate goal that should be something like scientific progress, something like that. So, uh, I mean, we do need some sort of theory of what makes science progress and what makes science not progress, right? This should be our assumption or theory on which we build these indicators, like for open science, what is the epistemological justification of open science, right? And so what do you think about the kind of 
epistemological framework that you need to justify these kinds of, of indicators. Because in the early times, scientific when there was all this discussion about theory of citations, right? So why people cite and how, if and how citation tracks some sort of scientific development. I think that these kinds of discussions are here lacking. Uh, that is true, but this was not our <laughs> yeah. assignment. And also, uh, yeah, of course, a report like this is a bit of an intermediate thing. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that the different recommendations would also make sense for people who have different philosophical philosophical assumptions with respect to science. Uh, your question about open science, well, me, I personally like very much the work of Sabina Leonelli, who uh, wrote uh, a beautiful work on uh, the philosophy of open science, which is also critical uh, with respect to the dominant policy perspective in the European Union. So, um, so, and that that's what I like very much that um, because he makes on the basis of uh, empirical research the claim that many expectations of what open science should do, uh, which is based basically on a model of science as instrumental to promote growth of capitalism, rather than this beautiful ideal of creating more knowledge. Um, and she tries to unpack the different assumptions in her books. Uh, the latest book is really interesting about open science. Um, and also connected with older ideas about what, yeah, older or more, more, more established ideas about what science should do, should do and should be. Um, and I think that our recommendations would fit that model of open science quite well. Um, uh, also, because um, yeah, it's a bit of a that's a debate with Eve again whether we should have made clear that. Qualitative evidence is not a matrix. We didn't we didn't emphasize that so much. What we emphasized is, please do not only rely on uh, pre pre configured indicators or on things that you're actually not completely aware of. Um, also, in also uh, include qualitative evidence. So evidence is often what you need rather than metrics. Um, um, yeah, and um, yeah, a report like this is always a bit of a strange, um, it's basically an intermediate phenomenon. So it tries to link what I said in the beginning, um, advanced state of the art possibilities with respect to metrics, um, the debate about the responsible research evaluation in Europe, which is indeed a bit of a local debate, but for European universities, it's quite important, uh, which also has implicitly built in assumptions about what research should be and what academics should do. Apart from research, it's often about teaching, about very different jobs that people also need to do, and how do you reward and recognize that in relation to research evaluation. And, uh, and third, um, yeah, the, uh, the, ne the, the necessity to try to kill um, harmful practices like this, you know, I've I've seen from from very close close up now how uh, when a university drops a few points in uh, so Leiden University drops 20 points in Shanghai ranking or something, what happens is that members of the advisory council of the university board start to phone the rector, Magnificus, what's happening, and then. What happens is, yeah, I want to know where are we good at? And then the rector thinks, oh my God. Um, so she starts to phone deans. Yeah, where are we good at? <laughs> so give me, you know, a, so then uh, before you know it, a mapping exercise is starting <laughs> where you have to try to visualize your world winning people in the different faculties. And, and then, the, of course, the debate is, can't we get rid of the other people? <laughs> It did, this, this, this didn't happen in Leiden, by the way, but this is the mechanism that we are dealing with and, and try to, to build in some defensive walls against these processes is also helpful, we think. So that's also one of the elements in the report. 
Paul, thank you very much. And as you can imagine, I was most intrigued by the uh, interactive visualization of the demands and the, 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 the needs. It's on the, web. it's on the web, yeah. yeah. On, on, the, on the web. So I have a check question and then I have a more a real oh, question. Okay. So the check question is if you have thought about dissemination also towards the EOSC and all those kind of Eric forums and other European Commission intermediate layers. Yeah. You have, okay. And the other question is, <laughs> because I'm also buried sometimes in those recommendation jungle, yeah? And uh, you saw, I, I found the categories, you have listed them on both sides. They in themselves are interesting, yeah? And then you must have had discussions about why to come up with the lists you presented. And you must have had even more discussions on the errors you were drawing, for sure. Yeah, so I was wondering if there is a, a generic potential in this approach, how you reach this kind of interactive visualization, which might, which might be able to travel to all the other kind of poor guys and girls, which are stuck in producing policy recommendations and actually don't know anymore what kind of recommendation text they had written five years ago. So I was in the task force of the EOSC and we had a hard time to come up with any kind of visualization because the, the recommendations are, are usually on a very high generic level and to kind of make them checkable is not easy to do. So is there a method to win in this? Um, possible method? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, it does indeed uh, be discussed um, we did discuss this question in different ways in the in the group. Uh, we started the debate with the question: Okay, uh, there are already many recommendations. Eh? It's a bit uh, what he uh, uh, asked, but then in different uh, language. Uh, why should we write another report with more recommendations? Um, and then uh, we, we saw this moment as an opportunity to bring together. Uh, material that is relevant, but we also emphasized in the presentation to the Leary board um, that the next step should not be another report with recommendations, but experimental implementation of different practices rather than policies. Um, Jeroen Bosman was, uh, he is uh, one of the leading experts at the library of Utrecht University. He was actually leading this idea about um, how can universities make much better use of the data they already have? And how could we then make sure that we are not selling those data again to outside companies and then have to uh, buy them back with even more public money uh, channels into private coffins? Um, but uh, be much more proactive by uh, using in-house expertise. Uh, and also, uh, but this, this means that it's really important that the appropriate context and level is guarded. So it's not being used in other ways. And this is very tricky because we know how these things tend to go because of the social structures in which we operate. Um, so that's so the idea is basically uh, also to be become a bit more experimental and playful in the field of research evaluation. Um, and um, this could be done if we take seriously the idea to evaluate with the evaluate it rather than impose it on research communities. So to also include the research communities in setting up interesting experiments. Um, and this is all necessary because of all sorts of new links that universities now have with uh, internal parties. In that sense, uh, I'm going back again to the first questions. Um, uh, we are now living in a very different academic uh, world than when I started to study chemistry in 1968. It's really different. We've got the primitive numbers because of the capital involved because of the knowledge intense companies that are sometimes have more uh, uh, talent in-house than universities. 
um, it's really a different uh, uh, ball game. Uh, so uh, that's why it's also necessary to translate old insights in new forms again, even though it's not totally new. That's crazy. <laughs> ah, our regular. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alberto is the one who does. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's a tension I wouldn't mind you speaking more on. And you, I mean, you acknowledge there's a tension. On the one hand, you said there's mistrust about being honest about assessment among academics. And then what you were saying is in your capacity as a dean, you found that uh, the academics were actually brutally honest about assessment. So two context, two pieces of context here is uh, all of us who have worked in the United States uh, have experienced these reaccreditation processes. You go through every 10 years where peer institutions evaluate each other. And uh, there's a, it's mostly concerned with, uh, this isn't quite true, but it's a lot of concern with teaching effectiveness, measuring teaching effectiveness. That's a yeah. core. And I would say there's a lot of dishonesty. And I was working as an assessment coordinator at university uh, when one of these was happening. So, and it was just, people were trying, were thinking the job was to show they're effectively teaching rather than to assess whether they're effectively okay. teaching. And the second one that would just draw, example, would draw attention to it is, I just heard a, someone did a meta study on citizen science projects and a very interesting study. And Who they, was that? that? Who was that? Oh, I'm blanking on her name. Oh, okay. Someone from California, Davis. Okay. Yeah. And she reports that only two studies reported failings of reaching some sort of goal, assessment goal. That is in part because no one's measuring anything that they might fail at. So we've got this uh, prejudice to sort of measure, measure up success. Well, that, that's a fair point, good point. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert in, in teaching uh, effectiveness things. Um, my, my idea about honesty was um, maybe uh, too idealistic, but based on the experiences we have in the peer review process of scientific publications, because this is really a mechanism that helps to improve the manuscripts usually. And of course, there are also enough examples of uh, counter, counter examples of people who uh, try to to damage their uh, 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 you know the, the, the stealing etc it also happens but institutionalized institutionalizing process of trust processes of trust building does make a difference in a community whether that's available or not and my feeling is that, well, in, in European universities, we actually don't know how to uh, be uh, uh, sure that we know whether teaching is effective and what does it mean to be effective. So at my university, very often student surveys are being used, which is about satisfaction of the students with the teacher. But of course, that has nothing to do with the question whether the teaching will in the end in 20 years time have you know produced a, a more knowledgeable uh, uh, person uh, that's a very different question um, with respect to the, the citizen I think so th this is about whether or not um, trust building mechanisms are institutionalized I'm not naive about individual people but it's about social structure, which generates or does not generate a certain level of trust or mistrust. And my feeling is that since the 80s, the universities have been uh, influenced more and more by a culture of fundamental distrust, which in a way is contradictory to the institutional culture that was built into the academic community. So that, that was what I tried to say. About the citizen science, I think that's a good point. Um, I also have the feeling that many studies of societal impact are actually constructed in the context of an evaluation with hindsight whether or not something was successful, and they try to show performance. They show they try to show activity. We have been active in 
producing something for companies or for uh, social media or for new forms of publics. And it has nothing to do, of course, with impact. That's about being active in certain ways of communication. Now, it can be useful to know that and to value that, depending on the mission you have. I can imagine universities that want to create a more knowledgeable local culture of companies. That's a very valuable mission. And then you would want your researchers, or some of them, not all, to also communicate with those and with those communities, with those companies. And but that's 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 um, so. I think your state of the the conclusion. I, I would like to read that publication, by the way. But I think it's fair to say that citizen science is in a relatively early stage, also of conceptualization, um, and that there are not yet any critical studies uh, because in some in some fields it would not make sense at all to try to include citizens in your agenda setting exercises and in other fields it would be you know the thing to do uh, we have a very successful as a guy called bourgeois bourgeois a dutch archaeologist who was able to include thousands of citizens in uh, uncovering potential grave sites in the netherlands in uh, in the few parks that we have we tend to call them woods but they're basically parks um, and, um, uh, and, and they were able to identify interesting spots that could then be uh, imaged with, uh, you know, uh, uh, state of the art uh, uh, imaging technologies. Uh, and these, the interesting thing was these people are extremely enthusiastic about being part of a scientific enterprise. So they are, they will be less easily seduced by anti science uh, nonsense. So it's really interesting, but that's one project. So whether or not all the money that goes into citizen science does make any sense will be something for the future. I don't know yet, but I think there is promise, but it really depends on the context. We, we still have time for a professor chance question. If someone is willing to make a short question, please stand up and get ready. Okay. <laughs> Let me prioritize people. Maybe people have not questions. yet been. So, Professor Chan. Thanks. Thank you for the uh, insightful presentation. I have a question. Uh, maybe it's beyond your scope uh, of the project, but uh, I'm thinking about this. So uh, these days, most of the time when I hear about this interdisciplinarity, I start to think arrange the marriage. And so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, one thing is to measure the speed as a performance, and, but if the direction is wrong, and then, yeah. and then you get. So, I was wondering do you have any kind of the uh, scenarios or showcases that should first generation? You could do this, or you could do this badly. The second generation, you you won't be able to do make this kind of errors, mistakes. So that that's pro probably one for communication purposes. Uh, wide audience will be wondering what do I get by move to the second generation. But my uh, question about is uh, policy level. Uh, are they are there any way that you indicate the policy is wrong and you? Perform well with that policy, you get worse. So that's that, that's my thinking. It's probably not. Well, that's certainly true. Uh, very good point. Uh, this is also why we. Uh, it's a bit out of scope in terms of interdisciplinarity because we didn't focus on uh, on how uh, researchers could use uh, scientometric uh, insights and analysis to identify interesting areas for new initiatives to bring different fields together. I think, uh, personally, I think that this is one of the under, uh, one of the areas in which metrics could be used much more by PIs, not by evaluators, but by acting researchers. But that's a different, that's outside of the scope of this report. I do, uh, but there is one uh, point uh, relevant. This, this is one of the reasons why we strongly emphasize that universities should First, put 
uh, make make clear in what direction they want to develop. So uh, and and this also at the level of the research community, the academic community. So we try, we basically uh, also, and this this of course is a tension we are all dealing with, that universities are both an academic community, and an enterprise. Uh, and this is in fact an, a contradiction. Uh, the academic community um, has mechanisms and dynamics and, and certain values and desires, uh, but the university leadership also has to deal with the fact that it has that they, they don't want to go broke. They need they need you know proper finance. They need uh, and this enterprise dimension has become too dominant with respect to the community, we need to uh, rebalance again, but that's a very different, it's an underlying element, but much implicit in this report, not explicit, but it is a, a certain a good point, absolutely.